one-fifth of the land surface of the Earth is covered by deserts, which is almost 50 million square kilometers. To many, the word desert evokes images of vast seas of shifting sands. But in reality, sand dunes cover only one-tenth of the land surface of arid regions. Even in the case of Sahara, the largest desert in the world, sand dunes cover only a third of the land area. Thus, major portions of the deserts may be mountainous, rocky, or may comprise of vast stretches of salt flats. So what qualifies as a desert? According to experts, any area of land receiving less than 25 centimeters of rainfall in a year is classified as a desert. Thus, deserts are mainly the creation of the global patterns of the climate. The yellow areas in this world map show the semi-arid and arid regions. And if we look carefully, we will notice that the world deserts are all located between 15 and 30 degrees parallels of latitude on both sides of the equator. The Sahara Desert, the world's largest desert, is in North Africa. The Kalahari Desert is also located in Africa and it is in the southern end of the continent. The Thar, the Great Indian Desert, is spread out over western India and Pakistan. The desert belt continues further into the Middle East and finally, the Great Australian Desert. All these deserts are hot and subtropical. Deserts like the Great Basin and the Mojave Desert of USA the Patagonian Desert in South America and the high altitude deserts of Central Asia are all sheltered by mountain ranges and vast continental areas. These are classified as rain shadow deserts. The Atacama Desert in Chile in South America is a coastal desert that receives no rainfall as it is influenced by cold coastal currents. It is the driest desert in the world. The subtropical deserts are hot, with daytime temperatures here as high as 50 degrees Celsius. Extremes of temperatures are a characteristic of most deserts. The temperature rises high during the day, and at night, because there is no cloud cover or humidity, it may fall as low as 4 degrees Celsius. Without adequate protection, people often die of exposure. During the day, the ground heats the air so much that the air rises in waves that one can actually see. These simmering waves confuse the eye and cause one to see distorted images called mirages. However, all deserts are not hot. The Patagonian Desert in South America, the steppes in Siberia, and the Trans-Himalayan Deserts in Ladakh and Spiti are seasonally very cold. But what is common to all deserts is the scarcity of water, and as a result, there is either no vegetation or it is very sparse. The tough desert conditions give rise to some remarkable drought-resistant species of plants. These plants naturally grow with wide spacing, which allows each plant to gain the maximum from the scarce moisture. The structure of these plants is adapted in various ways to obtain and conserve moisture. Most of these plants have small leaves so as to minimize the loss of moisture through evaporation. Some, like the desert cactus, have shallow, wide-spreading root systems which soak up water quickly after a rainfall and store it in their cells. The saguaro cactus, which grows in the deserts of USA and Mexico, is a living water storage tank. It can store hundreds of liters of water one would imagine the desert to be devoid of life. 
but this is not so. Like the plants, the living things in the desert have adapted themselves to the harsh environmental conditions and thrive well. No picture of the desert would be complete without the mention of the camel. This animal is highly suited to this harsh environment. It has well-padded feet, which do not sink in the sand, allowing it to move easily over shifting sand. The camel has tufts of hair around its eyes, which keep out the wind-blown sand. The myth that camels store water in their humps is not true. A camel, however, stores fat in its body. And during periods of shortage of food or water, the camel draws on this fat. Hydrogen molecules in the fat combine with the oxygen it breathes to form water. Another unique desert dweller is the yak, found in the cold desert in Ladakh, Tibet, and parts of Central Asia. The yak can withstand extreme cold and move with greater ease even in snow-covered hills. It is a very useful draft animal and also provides meat and wool. Rainfall is scanty in the desert, but when it does rain, the effect is quite dramatic. Flash floods are quite common here, and when they occur, the mud and silt-laden water scours the ground, carrying before it huge amounts of mud and silt. High-velocity winds with speeds of over 100 kilometers an hour often blow across the desert. Since there is little vegetation or moisture to bind the loose surface materials, the effects of wind erosion are almost unrestrained. These strong desert winds lift loose materials from the desert floor and blow these along. This process is known as deflation. Depending on the size of the material, unconsolidated sand and pebbles may be carried in the air or rolled along the ground. Fine dust and sand may be carried for miles before being deposited, sometimes even beyond the margins of the desert and across continents. Landforms in the desert come in a great variety. They are a result of a combination of factors. High velocity winds with the predominance of bare ground, the effect of infrequent and violent rainfall, the extremes of temperature between day and night are the chief factors that affect these landforms. Two essential features are apparent in arid and semi-arid landscapes. Firstly, the existence of broad and gently sloping surfaces known as piedmonts, which descend from steep slopes. Secondly, the complexity of the landform profile is very impressive. The slightest change in the rock type is reflected by a sharp break in slope. Let us see how wind, heat and moisture shape the desert landforms. Weathering is the most potent factor for reducing rock to sand in arid regions. Even though the amount of rainfall is small in the desert region, some of it manages to penetrate into the rocks and sets up chemical reactions in the various minerals. Intense heating in the day 
and rapid cooling of radiation at night sets up stresses in the already weakened rock so that they eventually crack and break down to be further acted upon by the sand. Fluctuations in temperatures and chemical changes cause the rocks to weather unevenly. Hollows, called taphoni, form in the rock faces by weathering and promote their own expansion by harboring moisture. Eventually, a striking honeycomb effect is produced. Over time, these rocks crumble into coarse sand grains. The rocks heat up during the day and cool down rapidly at night. This sets up stresses on their upper surfaces and the rocks start to crack and peel like onion layers. This process is called exfoliation. Large boulders and masses of rock are eventually whittled down and reduced in size. The broken down material is then available for the formation of sand. In the high altitude and cold continental deserts, water enters cracks and joints of rocks. At night, when the temperature drops, the water in the cracks freezes and expands. The shattered fragments of rock are called scree. The erosive action of wind on flat surfaces is also very interesting. Deflation, which is the removal of surface material, results in the lowering of the land surfaces and the formation of a depression, which is called a deflation hollow. The Kantara depression in the Sahara Desert is a depression hollow and is over 100 meters below sea level. When wind-borne particles collide against each other, they wear each other away and their size is gradually reduced and the grains get fairly rounded like tiny millet seeds. This process is called attrition. When the wind hurls sand particles against rocks, it causes the abrasion of the rock surfaces. The rocks get scratched, polished, and are eventually worn down. Abrasion is the greatest at or near the base of the rocks, and it is here that the maximum wind erosive action takes place. Rock pedestal or mushroom rocks are formed by the sand blasting effect of the wind against any projecting rock mass. The constant sand blasting wears the softer layers of the rock, producing irregular, fantastic and often grotesque looking rock structures called rock pillars. Such rock pillars are further eroded near their bases where friction is the greatest. This process of undercutting produces rocks of mushroom shape and the structures are called mushroom rock. Small rock ridges called yardangs are also produced by the action of wind. Hamadas, 
or desert platforms are another feature found in the deserts. These are large, polished, flat rock bed surfaces, exposed by deflation and rubbed smooth by erosion. They are often laid like a fine mosaic on the desert floor. Sustained wind action polishes these rocks to greater smoothness. In semi-arid regions, the prolonged action of wind and water erosion results in the wearing away of softer rocks, leaving behind masses of hard rock structures, which are called booties, mesas, and incelbergs. Wind-borne materials are shifted according to their coarseness. The heavier sand particles remain on the floor of the desert, as dunes and other depositional forms. These seas of sand, however, are rarely static. Their flow and migration depends on several factors, like the size of the particles, the direction and velocity of the wind, and the location and nature of the surface over which these particles are found. The presence or absence of water and the natural vegetation is also a controlling factor. Sand is moved and deposited by wind in the form of ripples, dunes, sand ridges, and shoots of loess. Ripples form transversely to the wind direction. Some are aerodynamic ripples, created by regular patterns of wind turbulences. The others are ballistic ripples, formed by the bouncing or saltation of most wind-blown sand. These moving grains of sand form sand dunes. Sand dunes come in a wide range of shapes, sizes and patterns. The classic crescent-shaped Barkhan sand dune is only found on hard desert surfaces that have little or no sand covering. Barkhans are initiated by a chance accumulation of sand at an obstacle, such as a patch of grass, or a heap of stones. The windward side is convex and gently sloping, while the leeward side being sheltered is concave and steep. They occur transversely to the direction of the wind, so that their horns thin out and become lower in the direction of the wind due to the reduced frictional retardation on the wings along the edges. The crest of the sand dunes moves forward as more sand is driven up on the windward side and on reaching the crest, slips down the leeward side so that the dune advances. The rate of advance varies from 5 meters a year for high dunes measuring 30 meters to 20 meters for smaller dunes which may be only 3 to 5 meters high. Dunes may run parallel to the wind direction for hundreds of kilometers in some cases. These longitudinal dunes are called seeps. The crest line of the seeps rises and falls in alternate peaks and saddles in a regular succession like the teeth of a saw. The dry desert gullies, which contain running water only after a heavy rainfall, are called wadis or arroyos. The walls of these ravines are typically steep and irregular. The tremendous amount of material eroded in these wadis is moved by flash floods and may be carried very far into the desert. In arid regions crossed by rivers that gain their water elsewhere and manage to maintain a regular flow, very deep valleys and canyons are cut into the rocks. The most dramatic example of this is the Grand Canyon in USA and the canyons in the Spiti Valley in the Himalayas. 
The growth of the channels, however, does not depend on erosion alone. The channels are also shaped by the weathering of the valley sides by mass movement of weathered material, which moves down due to the force of gravity. The desert environment is very harsh, but even then, these arid lands are not empty. Over a billion people, which is one-fifth of the world's population, live in these arid lands. The Thar Desert of Rajasthan in India is the most densely populated desert area in the world. Life here is very hard and a constant struggle against the elements. of the Thar that is unique is the presence of a community of people who have not only adapted well to the desert but are well off as a result. These are the Bishnoi who practice conservation as a creed. They do not cut green trees or kill any animals. In fact, 250 years ago, over 300 of the Bishnois gave up their lives protecting their trees. Their homelands teem with a diverse variety of bird and animal life. Special among these is the black buck, an antelope which has been hunted to extinction in the subcontinent, but thrives in the areas where the Bishnois live. The pressure of the increasing human populations is intense. Livestock in ever-increasing numbers are overgrazing and converting vast areas of land into dust bowls. In the quest to produce more food, even marginal land, which is best suited to be pasture land is being brought under the plough. In India, in the Thar too, the human pressures are being felt and the desert is spreading. Unfortunately, it is not the climate that is causing desertification, but human action. Today, deserts are the last refuge from a crowded world. In their very starkness lies a searing beauty but the pressure of population is making inroads even here. The long-term threat is to the well-being of the planet, which as we know, is a delicate and fragile combination of diverse systems that keep our living planet in good working health. 